Well, hello and welcome to our study of Heaven and Angels. Uh, as you've seen on the screen, we're going to be looking at a lesson entitled Living in a Far Better Place. If you have your Bibles, open them up to Philippians chapter 3. Our focal passage is going to be Philippians 3, chapter, or chapter 3, verses 20 to 21. But we will look at a background passage that gets more at Paul's attitude about heaven in some way as we look at Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 to 24. So as I said, if you have your Bibles, open those up. And we'll look at those in a moment. Uh, the title of our unit, of course, has been Heaven and Angels, Our Eternal Home and Its Heavenly Hosts, A Study of Heaven. This is actually going to be the final lesson on our study of heaven, beginning with the next lesson. And for the five ensuing lessons, we'll have a study of angels. Uh, whatever the Bible has to say about angels, we'll look at that in some form or fashion. As we've said, though, regarding heaven, the Bible has much more to say about heaven than what we've been able to study. We've only got a glimpse of it. We've tried to put some pieces together. And the same is going to be true when we look at angels. And I'll say more about that in the next lesson. But uh, we'll at least get a, a little glimpse, if you will, as to the heavenly hosts that God has created as those who could serve us as we live in this world and uh, among whom we will abide in heaven, in the new heaven, in the new earth. Uh, as we get started, I want to do something I don't really ever do, and that is to go through the GC2 press material that we actually that actually serves as a backdrop for the lessons that we study. Uh, all of these correspond to the titles and passages that are related to uh, the GC2 press materials that we've been looking at. I want to go ahead and look at the things that they have offered up, the author has authored up for this lesson with regard to the main idea, the question to explore, the study aim, and a quick read. And I think all of that together will kind of set us up for what we're going to be looking at today in our study of living in a far better place. So let me do that first. And then what I want to do is go back and talk about the outline of the passage that we're going to look at, the passages that we're going to study. And then we'll come back and look at each of those uh, verses uh, individually. And as always, we'll come back with some final reflection, thoughts, and application as we go through. But I found it striking, and unusually these are very helpful, and as a result, I think if you're following along with that material, you can use it, but I want to just bring up the fact that there are some particularly poignant statements here with regard to the passage, and it kind of sums up what we've been talking about with regard to heaven in general through these lessons, that it's a wonderful place, we look forward to it, but we've been called to live out our lives here until we reach that point. The main idea of today's lesson, then, is heaven is made for believers, and believers are made for heaven. Being homesick for our eternal home, therefore, is a natural part of our existence on earth while we wait, and we should be busy sharing the way to heaven with others. The question to explore then would be this, what should occupy my time while I wait to join Jesus in heaven one day? The study aim then is this, to understand that God designed us to be in heaven with him for eternity, but until then we can share the way to heaven with others. So we see the, the common theme there. With the quick read, then, a summary of our lesson, we have this. Heaven is not just some add-on at the end of an already full life. If you understand what heaven really is, you will know it is the one special place you were designed to live for eternity. Tell others the way to go to heaven in the meantime. And that's going to key in on some of the things that we see Paul do in this passage as we move forward. Given the fact that we've been studying heaven and we've looked at Revelation, for that, we know that there are other places in the Bible that talk about heaven, whether it's a reference to a place of abiding with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit throughout eternity, or a given description of what that place will look like. We saw a little bit of that in the book of Revelation. There are other places, however. As I've said in lessons past, the most important aspect of heaven, the new heaven and the new earth, is that it is a place where God will abide with his people for all eternity. We recognize that here we have a glimpse of that through the abiding Holy Spirit in us until such time as the new heaven and new earth come into existence for us and we live eternally without obstacle, without barrier, without any roadblock, without any hindrance in our relationship with God. We've talked about that over and over again. The lesson title, of course, is Living in a Far Better Place. And when I hear that title, I think of a lesson that we discussed earlier on particularly lesson one, when we looked at a reference to a better country. Abraham and Sarah, knowing that God called them to the what we would call the promised land, the land of, of, of Israel, the land of Palestine, the land of Canaan, 
that was evidence for them that there was an even better country. So I just re bring to your mind again, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse six, where they were looking to a better country, a better city whose architect and builder was God. One hint of what is also better that we'll see, and I'll expand on in another passage as a side note to our lesson, is that we also will have a better body. And that's going to be significant. Many of us may not be satisfied with the body that we have. We'll see, though, that heaven, the new heaven, new earth, will be a place of physicalness, uh, but in a better way because of the glorious nature that we will receive in that sense. And I want to bring that out because there is a hint of that in this passage that Paul in another place will actually have expanded upon that. And I want to give us all of that as well. Well, as we look at the text, then I want to read to you both the focal passage and the background passage uh, after I give you a look at the outline. We're going to break up the text into three sections. So let me go ahead and show you what the outline of the text is going to look like. We're talking about living in a far better place. We're looking at Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 to 21. First passage we're going to look at in verse 20, I will entitle it, Citizens of Heaven Awaiting a Heavenly Savior. Then, verse 21, the transforming power of our Heavenly Savior. There are a number of ways that we could have um, titled that. You'll see what I mean when we look at the text. And then we'll gather up all of what we have in chapter 1, verses 21 to 24, weighing the options and then making the choice. Let me go ahead and read these passages to you in tandem with one another. I'll go from one to the other. Yes, we're reading the passage in chapter 3 first. Then we'll go back and look at chapter 1, and I'll summarize a little bit of that before we get into the details of the passage. Let me go ahead and read to you from the New American Standard Bible, the 2020 edition. And I'll read to you the first two verses, and then we'll skip back to chapter 1. One of the things that Paul says here then in chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform the body of our lowly condition into conformity with his glorious body by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Now, real quickly, before I go on to the next text, the fact that he says, for our citizenship is in heaven, indicates there's something he's already said that gives him the statement here, which is the basis or the grounds for what he's just previously said. And much of what he says there is pressing on toward the goal for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He has not reached it yet. He's attaining it. He talks about walking the way we should in conformity with the will of Christ. He says, for many walk of whom I often told you and now tell you, even as I weep, that they are the enemies of Christ, the cross of Christ. There are many that don't walk in conformity. He's calling us to walk in conformity. He knows that there is going to be an, an end for them, but a, a, a reward for us who are believers. Why? For our citizenship is in heaven. I'll say more about that in a moment as we get to the details of that text. Let's go back to Philippians chapter 1 and look at verses 21 to 24. Again, in the in introduction, Paul has identified who he is, his prayer for them, uh, the fact that he's been preaching the gospel. Key here for us is that he's in prison. And in the moment that he writes this, he doesn't know for sure what the end will be, at least in his mind, but yet he can know perhaps in the spirit what will take place. And I want to touch on that as we go through the text as well. First, let me go ahead and read verses 21 through 24. He says, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean faithful or fruitful labor for me. And I do not know what to choose or which to choose, but I am hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is far much better, very much better, say, yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. We'll come back and look at that text again in a moment. Make sure I give you a clear reading of that text. But as we go forward, Paul says we are citizens awaiting a Savior, a heavenly Savior. Again, we said that the word for, meaning because or therefore, uh, is the idea that there's picking up uh, what he has just said. We want to live our lives in such a way that we bring glory to Christ, despite the fact that there are many who do not. And many of those are enemies of, of the cross of Christ, as Paul has pointed out. Many of those he would consider those that are kind of like the Judaizers. They uh, are... Uh, obscuring the gospel for the sake of Judaism. And Paul is saying, no, we follow Christ through his grace first, and he has paid the price for our sin. We don't need to go through the process of becoming a Jew first and living out what the law of Moses is. We do that naturally by loving one another and loving God. He says, why do we live a certain way? Our citizenship is in heaven. The word 
citizenship really is something like a place to abide. It's the commonwealth. We do get our word politics from it, the idea of living in the polis or in the city. Uh, it's important to recognize that much of what Paul does in the letter to the Philippians, and he does this in other letters, is that he correlates what he is saying using analogies based on what they are familiar with. So Philippi was a really strong uh, Roman province, a Roman city. And of course, the citizens or the members or the residents of Philippi were largely citizens of Rome. And many soldiers would go there after they retired. They recognized their uh, association with Rome, with the Roman government. Paul is saying as believers, that has all changed. Uh, he says, we need to live as citizens of heaven. You go back and read chapter 1, verses 27 to 30. He points that out. Here, he's reminding us, we are citizens of heaven. Our real place, our real place of residency, our, quote, homeland, is heaven, the true place of abiding for us. He's saying that while you may live as a citizen of Rome, um, if you are a citizen of Rome in the city of Philippi, your real place of abiding is in heaven. He says, we live as citizens of heaven because our citizenship is in heaven. Uh, one of the things I'd like to pull in here is the fact that in the previous lesson, we talked about the book of life and how there is a, quote, registry there of names of those who um, have given their lives over to Christ. They have submitted themselves and they are in relationship with Jesus and they have the Holy Spirit in the middle awaiting, awaiting this uh, new heaven and new earth. This idea then of having our names on the registry identifies our citizenship. Paul is saying that our citizenship is in heaven. There's much to think about that. We've already been discussing the fact that uh, what heaven looks like to an extent, what we await there, and what will take place as we get there. We've discussed all of that, so I'll call your mind back to the previous seven lessons. Here, Paul is doing it in such a way as then to present what we might call a dilemma. What do we do knowing what is coming? What do we do? We've read the uh, introductory statements from our lesson material and indicate that there is a place for us, but there's a work for us here. So there is a place for us in the future. There is a process or a task or an assignment that we have until then. Paul says that we have our citizenship in heaven. And it is then the next point in verse 20, that we look from heaven or we look to heaven from which will come our Savior. Now, if we are believers in Christ and Christ followers, and of course, he's already our Savior. But Paul can talk about salvation in the future sense as well, and that is when Jesus returns. Where is Jesus going to come from? He's going to come from heaven. Paul says we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's talking about the return of Jesus. We know that heaven is a place where we go, uh, and in many respects, we go there for a time until heaven and earth join together in the new heaven, new earth. But it's clear that there is a time when Jesus will return. He says, we eagerly wait a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not a place for us to get into detailed eschatology and end times or all the different theories about what's going to take place. The Bible is very clear, however, as Paul indicates, that Jesus returns. Paul is saying we eagerly await a Savior from heaven, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is affirming that Jesus will come again. As I said, we're not going to get into all the theories. The thing that we can know for sure, though, is as Jesus has ascended into heaven, he will descend and make his presence known, and we will be joined together with him, and we will be able to spend eternity with him. What is heaven now will become a place where we all abide in the new heaven and the new earth, so we can eagerly await. Now, what Paul then goes on to do in chapter 3 in the next verse is talk about what will happen when Jesus comes. And there's where I want to do a little bit more expansion on what's going to happen in the process. He says this in chapter 3, verse 21, what I have entitled the transforming power of the heavenly Savior. Verse 21 begins with the word who, because he's just referenced Jesus, the Savior, the one who is coming from heaven. He will transform the body of our lowly condition into conformity with his glorious body, or some translations may say the body of his glory. He will do this by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. So what are we looking at? Well, Paul is talking about the fact that we have assurance that Jesus will return. Our citizenship is in heaven. That's guaranteed by our faith in Jesus. And we know that he's going to come back to take us with him. We will abide with him in eternity. What will happen in the process, Paul gives a hint of here in a letter to the Philippians 
that he has expanded actually in discussion earlier in two letters, first and second Corinthians. He wrote those uh, during his uh, third missionary journey. These those letters were written prior to his imprisonment in Rome. Um, here he just gives a hint of that. But I want us to go back and talk a little bit more about what that transformation looks like and then do a play on words a little bit with what Paul has said in the letter to the Romans using those same words in reverse. I'll say that in a moment. But he says here that he will transform the body of our lowly condition. Some of your translations may talk about the humble estate or the humble state of our, of our condition, of our, of our human bodies. We'll see in a moment in the passage that we read talking about corrupt and incorrupt. He says that he will bring it into conformity with his glorious body. Now, we know that when Jesus was raised from the dead, he took on a different form. It was still a physical body that now could do other things. What he's saying is we will be then transformed or conformed to his glorious body. And how will he do this? Paul is saying this is not going to be a problem because God has given Jesus power to subject all things to himself. And again, you can read about that in other places, particularly in 1 Corinthians, where uh, Paul talks about Christ being the head of the man and God being the head of Christ. In the meantime, God has given Jesus uh, power and authority over all things. Here, the power is to make that transformation. He has given the power to transform our bodies into conformity with his glorious body. He's able to do this by the power that was given him even to subject all things to himself. Now, the, again, the idea of subjecting all things to himself speaks to his authority, not just his ability, but it also speaks, and again, in a way that is contra the, the world system of the Roman government at this point. He is the one with the power. He is the one who is Lord and Savior, and therefore we put our trust in him. What he does is he transforms us to be in conformity to the body of his glory. Now, again, that's a very brief statement. What I would like to do, if you'll be patient with me, is I would like to read to you two passages that speak to this issue a little bit more detail. I won't go into a lot of commentary about that. I think the text will speak for themselves. But then the second passage is going to then come back to what we're talking about with regard to how we live our life and what we do in the meantime. If you have your Bibles again, open them up now to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to read you verses 50 to 58. What Paul does in 1 Corinthians is he first talks about the reality of the resurrection of Jesus. He defends the fact that Jesus truly rose from the dead. He talks about what the implications are of that. Then he talks about what the resurrection body will look like for those of us who are in Christ when he returns. So let me read that for you, because where he talks about being conformed to his glorious body, Paul is talking in Philippians about the humble or low position or condition of our body. Here in 1 Corinthians, he's going to use a couple of other words that I think will help us understand in some form or fashion, uh, the, the temporary nature to the eternal nature. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I want to read to you verses 50 through 58, and I will get there. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 58. He says, Now I say this, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I am telling you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable puts on the imperishable, and this mortal puts on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He concludes the chapter then, Therefore, my brothers, my beloved brothers and sisters, be firm, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Notice the language here, perishable to imperishable. Some translations are going to say corruptible to incorruptible. You also notice mortal to immortality. We will see ultimately that when Jesus returns, Paul talks about the return of Jesus, a heavenly savior uh, will appear for us. He mentions that here in a way similar to what Jesus talks about um, in the flash and the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, that death will be defeated. But then he goes on and concludes with this. And this is what we want to attach to what we're talking about in our main lesson today. Not only is the resurrection and heaven real, 
He says, but what we need to recognize is we want to stand firm, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, what he's saying there is similar to what we've talked about before when we talked about the rewards that we will get for the works that we've done for the Lord. In another passage in the Corinthian correspondence, we read chapter 5, and you could read the bulk of chapter 5, but we're going to read the first nine verses. We read verse 10 related to rewards when Jesus would come to judge based on the works that we did. Here's what he says before that, and we hinted at that in a previous lesson. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 9, For we know that if our earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made by hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this tent we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, since in fact, after putting it on, we will not be found naked. For indeed, we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now, he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight, but we are of good courage and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. So some other words that are used, he talks about being naked at first, being clothed, being without an earthly tent and having a heavenly tent or having an earthly tent transforming to a heavenly tent. Uh, he talks about the fact that there is being absent from the body and present and home with the Lord. We'll see that language used in a moment as well. What is Paul getting at? We have that which we await. We have the assurance of it. In the meantime, we have something that we have to do. And at this point, I want to pick up on what Paul says in chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, verse 21, talking about transforming our lowly position, the body of a low position, and bringing it into conformity with his glorious body. Paul uses similar language regarding how we are to live our lives now over in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, he says, by the mercies of God, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to offer yourselves up or your bodies up as living sacrifices, pleasing to God. He says this, to no longer be conformed to the image or the process or the, to be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Notice what he does there. He uses in regard to our bodies that there will be a transformation, Philippians talks about, to be conformed, transformed to be conformed. What he says is reverse here, no longer be conformed to the pattern of this world in the way we think, the way we act, and the way we live, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So that what's he saying? Though it's, it's not the point of Romans chapter 12, in one sense, to talk about heaven. He is talking about how we live our lives, given the fact that God has shown mercy to us. We are in the present time to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, no longer conform. What we're doing then is we live day by day, being transformed by the renewing of our minds. And then the rest of chapter 12 of Romans talks about how we live in relationship to one another and the world and governments and so forth, is that we do that according to the word of God transformed by the renewing of our minds. Then what Paul says in Philippians is that we can wait for the transformation of our body to be conformed to his glorious body. I hope that you follow along with that. I, I like to do the play on words there because what we're seeing here is it still ties in together with all that we've been saying. We look for heaven, but we have work to do here. Part of the work that we're going to talk about is how we serve one another. The other is work on who we are. Paul talks about in Philippians as well that because of what Christ is going to do, we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And work out doesn't mean we work for our salvation. It means we exert it. We practice our faith. We do that day by day. Paul is getting at that. Now, with all of that said, talking about the fact that we await the Savior, we wait for Jesus to return, we, we know he's going to take us to heaven, we know that it's a better place. We talked about that in Hebrews 11, a better country, a better city. We've read descriptions about heaven in different, different ways and different passages out of Revelation and a couple of other places. Paul has reflected in Romans about that, in the Corinthian correspondence about that. He talks about it in the Thessalonian letter too, and he talks about the return of Jesus. 
Here, what he says in this letter to the Philippians, as we'll read in a moment, is he talks about the prospect of heaven and what does that mean for him now? The extent of Jesus' power where he has given all things that he can subject all things to himself, that gives us a word of promise of heaven, a word of promise that Jesus will return. The question then becomes, what is the appropriate way to think about heaven in the, min in the meantime, in the interim? We've seen all the wonderful things related to heaven, all the positive things. And we've already said everything is going to exceed whatever beautiful description that we can give of it. We recognize that words um, escape us in describing all that heaven is. It's greater than what we can describe, and therefore it's even more of what we long for. Paul will reflect upon that with regard to his own current condition, being in prison. And what does that mean? We've read the passage. I want to go back through it again with you in a moment. I would say this, we would think it means that we should want to go to heaven immediately. If it's such a wonderful place, why don't we go immediately? And we'll talk about that in a moment. I'll just say we're going to look at Paul's words and then we'll reflect upon it here. Paul's words in regard to heaven, regard to receiving uh, the return of Jesus and being uh, brought back into full relationship with him, into his full presence, it's something that we eagerly await. He even says that in verse 20. Chapter 3, verse 20, we eagerly wait for a Savior from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. As he's discussed that later, notice what his attitude is before in chapter 1, verses 21 to 24. He's in prison. He's watched other people preach the gospel, some of them out of mockery for financial gain. He says, as long as the truth is being preached, he's fine, just as long as the gospel is being preached. Now he reflects upon his own position. In many ways, he does not know for sure what's about to happen to him, although he can give a positive uh, response here in a moment. I want to read a verse that I haven't read to you yet. He says this, as he's going through his circumstances, weighing the options, he's making a choice, and he makes a resolution toward his choice. He says this, if I'm to weigh it, he says this, for me to live as Christ, regardless of what happens, my goal, my purpose, my task, my assignment is to live for Christ. All that I am, all that I do is for the sake of Christ. Given that, he says, to die is gain. Because he knows what heaven is like. He knows what to be in the presence of God without hindrance or without obstacles is like. He understands what it means to have the full, unhindered relationship and fellowship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He says he calls it gain. We read in 1 Corinthians 15 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, all of what is the benefit, the glory, the beauty of that is, what the transformation is. He says it's gain. It's a better place. He'll say that again in a moment. Verse 22, though, he says this, if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. So he does know, again, to live as Christ, to stay here and live in the flesh means fruitful labor, means he has something to do. Here in general, he talks about the work that he has to do in a moment. He's going to talk about that work related to the Philippians. He says, it will be fruitful labor. But then he concludes verse 22, verse 22 with this, I don't know which to choose. Why? Because now he's going to weigh his options. Verse 23, I am hard pressed from both. The New American Standard puts the word directions in there. He's hard pressed from both directions. He's being pressed. He's being squeezed to make a decision. Here's what the decision is. He has a desire to depart, he says. To be with Christ, because that is gain. And he says that is better, and better for all the reasons that we've given. New body, new relationship with God, unhindered relationship. He says that is much better. But he concludes in chapter 1, verse 24, he says, Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. He knows that heaven is a wonderful place. We look at heaven as a place where we want to go. When asked, why is it that we don't want to go right away? Some of us may fear what that looks like, what the transition may look like, the transformation may look like. But Paul says that while we await and long for and expect the return of Jesus, and we expect and wait for the new heaven, new earth, as John describes it in the book of Revelation, there's still something we have to do. Paul recognizes that he has a task still. He still has something to accomplish. He has an assignment. He knows that that means fruitful labor for himself, more specifically to the Philippians and to the body of Christ in general. He says it's more necessary for your sakes that he remains. He knows that there is more to do. Now, in verse 25 following, while he can say he doesn't know what's going to happen, 
he can be assured in his spirit that there is a particular truth that will come about. He says in verse 25, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with, with all, excuse me, with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that your pride in Christ Jesus may be abundant because of me by my coming to you again. What he's saying is specifically to them, it would be necessary and good for them that he stayed. Let's wrap some of this up. We talk about the wonder of heaven. It's living for a better place. The text, the, trend, the title says living in a far better place. We look forward to living in a far better place. We long for that far better place. In the meantime, though, while we can anticipate what that's going to look like, Paul sets the pace for us when he talks about the attitude. Yes, we're torn. We want to go to heaven. We want to be free of the suffering. We want to be free of the travail and the tribulation and the opposition and all the things that weigh us down. Paul can say in Romans that the he, he knows that the suffering we endure now doesn't compare to the glory that we will experience in heaven. But he recognizes also that there is a need for us to remain. For him, that's fruitful labor. For you and me, that means fruitful labor. We have an assignment. What we need to do is find out what that assignment from God is and to carry it out. For Paul, that meant serving the Philippians and others in the body of Christ. What that means for us is that we are to serve the body of Christ. Let me put it this way. Even though Paul had a preference for heaven, he knew he had a task or an assignment to complete on earth. We can look forward to heaven. There's nothing wrong with that. But we still need to focus on our task or our assignment. Looking forward to heaven, in fact, can help us focus on our task, not for the sake of gaining a reward. We know that that's going to come when we are working uh, to please him, working to honor him, working to live the life that he's called us to live. There will be that reward. There will be that casting of crowns at his feet for the things that we have done. But the goal is to complete the task that he's given to us. If we went to heaven immediately after our salvation experience, who would preach to others about salvation? Who would serve others here? Paul points out the fact that as we live our lives daily in anticipation of heaven, being heavenly minded doesn't mean being no earthly good. It means doing everything we can to live in preparation for that. Part of that, as we read in the introduction to the lesson, is helping others get there as well. We have a task. Paul says to the Philippians that it's better for them that he remain. He has work for them so that they, in turn, can demonstrate their pride in Jesus. We want to do the same thing. We want to be able to share the gospel with others. We want to live a fruitful life. We want to live a life that will prepare us uh, for the return of Jesus. Paul uh, kind of echoes what Jesus says when he says that we need to watch and be ready for the return of Jesus so that we're not caught by surprise. And living for Jesus in the moment means that we're expecting him to return. And when he returns, it will be something that won't catch us by surprise. It will be something that we've anticipated and long awaited. The decision ultimately, of course, for Paul was out of his hands that what would happen, would he die in prison or would he be released? He affirms in verse 25, He's confident of his release so that he can be more used to the Philippians and the body of Christ in general. The principle that we want to derive from this then is, it's okay to look forward to heaven. It's okay to look forward to what the new heaven and new earth is going to look like, what an unhindered um, relationship will be with no obstacle. We will be um, with God. As the Bible says, he will be among his people. In the meantime, we have a task. Part of that task is sharing the gospel with others. Part of that is sharing uh, discipleship with others, helping each other grow in our relationship with Christ as we learn to love God and love others. So I want to encourage you as we conclude our study of heaven and get ready to study about angels in the next five lessons. Think about heaven. And in the meantime, think about what God has called you to do in the process of awaiting a Savior from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word that teaches us about heaven. We know that uh, you will give us a new garden with a new heaven and new earth. We know that we live in a fallen world, and that makes it difficult at times. We just come before you now thanking you that you give us something to long for. But in the meantime, you've also given us an assignment. So I pray that each of us would understand what your assignment for us is. What is it that you've called us to do? We know that you have called us to uh, be heralds and ambassadors of the gospel, to share the good news with others so that we can bring as many along with us as possible, that we can um, share the gospel with them that they may come to give their lives to you. And we also know that you've called us to be living a fruitful life, meaning to bear fruit in our uh, walk with you and what that means in terms of becoming more and more Christ-like. 
And I just pray, Father, that you will help us to do that day by day. May our desire for heaven help us focus more on the task that we have so that we will be even more ready for heaven when you when Jesus returns. Continue to guide and direct us in all that we do and help us daily, as Paul says, to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. We just want to honor you. And we pray that as the writer to the Philippians says, that we may give our lives um, the sacrifice of praise to you. We want to worship you. Help us day by day to do that. Again, help us to live for heaven day by day on earth to the benefit of others so that they may know you and live according to your will. And I pray that you will bring people into our lives to help us live the life that you've called us to live. Help us to encourage one another. Guide and direct us by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in conclusion, then, we want to talk about what our next lessons are going to be about. We're going to start a series in this unit on angels. And our first discussion is going to be from Luke chapter 20, verses 35 to 36. What do angels do? Uh, we're also going to be looking at a background passage that we want to identify. I'll give that to you as well. But we want to begin our study of angels. As I said before, uh, one, the Bible doesn't tell us a lot about angels. We're going to look at a few passages that tell us, while we may not know everything there is to know about angels, Scripture gives us enough to know what they do and appreciate them for what they do in service to us. And I just pray that as we do that, we will seek to understand what God wants us to from the text about angels, knowing that they are, and just speak a little bit away, they are ministering spirits. We're going to learn that when we study Hebrews chapter 2. In the meantime, what we want to do is we want to continue to walk day by day in the Spirit, led by the Spirit, given over to what He would do to guide us to be more like Jesus each day. Until then, as Moses instructed uh, Aaron to give a blessing to the people, I want to share that blessing with you, that it will be our conclusion. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up, lift up His face and give you peace.